An enormously warm welcome, everybody, from the Archive Performance of Greek and Roman Drama at uh, Oxford University to this reading. My name's Dr. Helen Eastman. I'm an associate artist of the APGRD, and it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to host this series of poetry readings. I'm also the director of Live Canon, the poetry publishers, and we've been it's been absolutely wonderful to wear both hats and pull them together into this reading series where we've welcomed poets who are working on or have worked on uh, work which riffs off the classics, whether that's classical literature or classical mythology. We've got an incredible quartet of poets reading today whose work has engaged with the classics in very different ways. Um, but it is an absolute pleasure to bring them together. And I know that over the course of the next hour, there's going to be an extraordinary richness to what we hear. I mean, absolutely indebted to them for taking the time to come and read today. And in some cases for the bravery of sharing uh, new work as well as recently published work. So thank you very much and welcome everybody. Uh, wherever you are watching this and uh, at whatever time you are watching this, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. One of the uh, bizarre upsides of uh, the pandemic is that we've obviously all learned how to um, live stream readings and that means that people can join us from all over the world. Um, it is a real shame not to all actually be together in the Classics Faculty at Oxford and able to chat afterwards, but uh, the downside of that is, is the upside for being able to welcome all of you from wherever you are watching today. Our very first poet is someone who has um, uh, spoken so eloquently about their relationship to the classics and their response to one particular myth which drew them me to their work. More of that in a moment. But I'm delighted to be introducing Andre Bagu, who is a poet and writer from Trinidad and Tobago. He is, in fact, uh, zooming in from there now, so um, it's much earlier in the morning for him than it is for the rest of us, so thank you. His essay collection on poetry, art and politics, The Undiscovered Country, was the winner of the 2021 OCM Bocas Prize for Nonfiction. His fiction debut, The Dreaming, was published by People Tree Press earlier this year. As a poet, Bagu is the author of several poetry collections, but most recently, Narcissus, which I hope he's going to read from today, which was published recently by Broken Sleep Books, a fantastic independent poetry publisher. Please do explore all of their titles. The book was described as beautiful, angry, and redolent with transporting detail and memory by Luke Kennard reviewing it. Bagu has also served as guest editor of the Poetry Review and is the managing editor of Moco, an online magazine dedicated to Caribbean art and letters. I heard him read and talk about his personal response to the Narcissus myth with uh, such um, uh, uh, warmth and wit that I was absolutely delighted to be able to invite him to be part of this series. So I'm going to hand over to Andre. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Helen, and such a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, I am going to be reading from Narcissus. Um, Many years ago, I was I went through a period where I was very, very um, interested in listening to Ted Hughes um, translations of, of uh, Metamorphosis uh, and the Narcissus myth in particular. And I would listen to this over and over again because something about it struck me as either queer or queer adjacent, you know, and, and I had this this idea of that. But then I put that aside and I went on with my business. Um, and then some years later, I read an academic article by James Williams, uh, or it may have been an article or a chapter somewhere in some book, um, in which he canvassed something of a tradition within Victorian times of querying the Narcissus myth. And I thought, oh yeah, this is really intriguing. Um, and as a result, I started to write a lot of poems related to this myth because I felt as though it was a great way to uh, explore questions of sexuality and even post-colonial colonial life um, here in Trinidad. So the first poem I'm going to read is called The Water in the Pond Considers Narcissus. He looks at me and sees right through me as if I am nothing, as if he could live without me. I bathed him each day moistly kissing the rise of his flesh, slapping his limbs and falling away, down and down, lower and cooler. The surface is all he sees, not the way I labor to raise his own face back up to him, 
not my rippled laughter, my silver mechanics, nothing. Now I know what I must do. When next he leaves, I will replace his face. I will lay still and let him come over me. The sun, the sun, I will rise. My vapors will take back everything. And all that will be left is the empty gash in the soil where I once made my bed, where I offered him all of my soul, my molecules, where I let him step into me deep, his buried flesh rejoicing. Instead, he will step and find nothing but a grave. So you might have recognized something of an Oscar Wilde connection there um, to that poem. And I should also say that um, Narcissus is uh, as much concerned with the Narcissus myth as it is concerned with the Echo myth, of course, uh, both stories being inherently bound, the fate of the destinies of both of these figures uh, inherently connected. And for me, as a poet, um, writing about classical myths is something of it's almost standard within the Caribbean space. When you think of figures like Derek Walcott, Anthony Capodillo, there is almost something of a tradition of talking back to the center, so to speak, um, by adopting or co-opting or perhaps recolonizing um, some of these tropes. So there are many, uh, many poems in the book that are called Narcissus because uh, obviously, there's an echoing happening, and the book is almost obsessed with itself. Um, and the next poem is called Narcissus, but here it refers, of course, to the plant, the daffodil. Narcissus, bulbs. Burrow deep each year into making it harder to breathe once more. Harder to rise through the angelic orders of dirt and rock for whom there is no springtime. Only the suffocation of I dig my fist into this earth, just this alone, buried here in darkness, could be the whole thing. Layers wrapped in night like obstacles to understanding. How could it be that I am from this ground, yet you are also from this ground? How could they know? what is encased in us, every mind hides itself. Stems, will the soil remember? Will the soil remember them? Desires roused by lute or horn, seeking to grasp or grasping, servants of the bow and arrow God, alike and kin, alike and false, Naked, succulent, hollow, the pointed tips of fingers carrying nostalgia for things they cannot see. Let there be madness in their ambition, their sword like being. Let the people panic at the sight of this green army of lances, echoes of government. Here she withdraws into wild places among foliage, in caves, and on mountainsides, bone to stone, flesh to voice. Flowers. Some species are extinct, small mouths opening, nature re-entering itself, hoping to renew. A center, white miasma of stormy days of mobile phone screens, of pages for poems. Sudden ripples, faces turning away like wind veins, deciding. Do you know Echo's flesh was ripped apart by shepherds? Once I lay in a field with a man beside me, his beard a furred country. With him I traveled to the mouth of a river in a dream of a river and found 
all that is left of the body is a flower. Narcissus. In this white bed, all things are made into a dream in which I fall into a lake, a small pond in which I disappear or am met each day with a new man, one with a hair lip, one with accusations, eyes saying no, no, mumbling self-loathing. Mirror mad, I see them through a window that makes itself into a loving opening to some place that is a conspiracy designed to keep, to keep me from myself. Who are they? Who are they? Which is to say, after the beating, my world crumbled. I couldn't show anyone my face. More of them began to appear. One with a trust problem, another callous with friends. The shadows of Plato's cave slid up the bedroom wall. The past troubling the curtains, bodies buried among lace. They took my father's watch, which I would wear long after it stopped. My father who knew, who saw, who told me, yes. Long after, he rose from the water, having changed like the ship of Theseus. In rippled light, he rose pebbled tombstones left beneath the surface, each marking small drownings, fallen masks, tiny surrenders to the randomness of water, to the crystalloid silk of each new body joyfully swum into. And he looked back at me naked, and I saw a new and in this wet circle, I loved him, you, and we knew. And the final poem I'm going to read is called Chapter Two. Um, I like to end normally with this poem because I hope it makes people wonder, well, what happened in Chapter One? Um, chapter Two. That morning, the radio was playing a song that felt familiar, even if I didn't know the words, didn't understand the language. I recognized the grainy static, the tinny voice, the muffled beats as though they were my thrumming heart, as though they were the rain that had fallen last night on the galvanized roof as you slept on top of me, smelling of too much cologne, your two Venezuelan friends huddled on a bed in the corner, and something rising in their chests like bread dough, Breaths, soft clouds now floating into the air as I dream out of the house, the yard. I pass the chickens, I pass the dogs, and someone follows me. Am I remembering correctly? I have a strange feeling as I did the night before, a feeling that there are sagas inside me waiting to be written, epics as heavy as the gold chain you wore as you thrust into me, and I tried to muffle my moans because it was all so sketchy. And even as I surrendered to pleasure, I still thought the weight of your pendant slapping my flesh was like the weight of something I might one day carry, some foundation stone, some temple. I didn't know where the taxi stand was, and I asked a man who gave me directions, then decided he would walk the short distance with me. Later, I roamed Port of Spain, knowing everybody could tell what I'd done, could smell the smoke from the club on me, could look into my eyes and see the drag queen, the pole dancer, the small room with walls of mirrors, the graveled yard outside on which footsteps crunch like whispered secrets, and groups of friends look at each other cautiously from a distance, because tomorrow is the question. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, we are all now wondering what happens in chapter one. And uh, thank you for such a tantalizingly brilliant ending to such a fabulous 
reading. I um, The intertextuality in your work is extraordinary, and you gave us uh, a glimpse uh, into that in terms of, of where that work sits for you, but also the amazing um, relationship between that and it, its humanity and um, honesty. Uh, the voice really shines through, and it's an absolute privilege to get to hear you read. For anyone who'd like to get their hands on Narcissus, it's uh, published by Broken Sleep, so um, please do, please support them and uh um and enjoy what is an extraordinary book and an amazing um addition to our uh the reception of that uh myth from your unique vantage point so thank you so much andre um our second poet reading today is paul julien and i'm absolutely delighted to introduce him because one of the strange uh, privileges of being um, an editor at a poetry press is that sometimes you get uh, sneak previews of work in progress before anyone else uh, gets to read it and I've been aware for a few years that Paul has been working on a very ambitious collection of uh, 60 poems that respond uh, to the Orpheus myth. Um, he is playing with such an extraordinary range of forms and styles in that collection and uh, vantage points and viewpoints uh, on that myth that I know uh, that when it comes out, it's going to be absolutely dazzling. But I've um, having, I hope, created a safe space in these readings for the sharing of new work. I've been bold and brazen and asked him if he'd come and share some poems from that collection uh, before they have reached, I think, any other audience. Um, so I'd like to thank him very much for uh, saying yes to that request. And I'd like to introduce uh, Paul Julien to read some poems from his work in progress, uh, Orpheus Underground. Thank you. Um, thank you, Helen, and others for making this possible. Um, a brief introduction. I don't have an academic uh, grounding uh, in the classics, but I do think that myths run through society almost like um, a scene almost in the collective conscious um, and that the stories and metaphors are very human and universal so this um, long sequence um, came about by imagining what would happen if Orpheus after losing Eurydice for the second time elected to take on the form of a mortal um, let's say taking on the body and mind of a middle-aged man a middle-aged musician living in the north of England in the 21st century, um, so that his thoughts and feelings, his fears, his desires sort of get mixed up with the host, um, who in this case is called Frank. So you may hear me refer to Orpheus and in some cases Frank. I'm going to read five poems um, without introduction from uh, five different stages of the collection, which is written in different forms. Some of it is in very structured in sort of traditional high poetics and some of it is just really loose verse and some of it is in dialogue um so orpheus discovers desire desire like thirst but less easily quenched sets off something in the veins it's when the body is most alive desire dies but can survive many deaths a cat's nine lives and nothing to the infinite lives of desire if desire is satisfied, it means it has died. Giving desire what it wants is what kills it. Desire doesn't exist in itself, it is hosted. The host's manifesting of desire is desire's only being. It only comes into full being when it fixes itself on one destination, one thing. Desire has never been painted, never pictured, never sculpted, never put into music. What has sometimes been painted or photographed or sculpted or put into music is a feeling touched by desire. An object or a person captured in the shadow of desire. But this flash of desire is merely a ghost because desire dies even in what is desired as soon as it is captured or described. Desire has nothing to do with youth or age. You could say it's most alive in the old for whom there's the least chance of its dying through being satisfied. Desire is desired, but if people could see how desire dies, nobody would desire it, because death is desire's end and summation. If you desire desire, you are desiring death. Desire is only fully itself in its death. Frank and the Waitress. What are you doing here, lonesome? Says the waitress to Frank. He's been sitting here for days, only focusing on space. 
my heart's been broke so often I can't figure out a damn thing. Then he tells her his troubles and she sets them all out straight. The past doesn't move, she says. It only looks that way. It's fixed in time and space, like a butterfly nailed in a case. And maybe when it lived, it was all colour and dance and fluttered wildly in the park. She gives him a backwards glance. The past doesn't move, but the present is restless and horrendously rushed. The present makes you dizzy and nauseous and flushed. Still, too, the past is drunk with our multiple selves, and this, this gives it the look of something in flux. Then she brings him the bill. No, you're wrong, he cries. The past is moving all the time. Nothing's the same twice. Every second here today utterly transfigures every feeling, every face, and every past disgrace. She stares at him aghast. The shame is always raw, he sighs. The pain is always white. Orpheus settles the bill. The coins settle in the plate. Orpheus' sonnet, The Mythographer. Orpheus never believed in the moon or Mars or the billion dollar dream of the stars, never believed in the death of desire or the despair that lies in its place. Even though pictures are beamed back from Mars and men are holding out for the fire or the water and Orpheus himself is fallen from space, Every day he is witness to the infinite spaces deserted by desire. Every day its ghost comes tearing at his throat, lunging at his lungs until breathing is undone. Now in the darkness, Orpheus is ready to believe in anything, aliens, fairies, jinns, the beast of feeling in the feelings of the beast. Orpheus on Tinder. Orpheus decides to join the other ghosts in the virtual world, others who are lost in the last act of being hopeful, new loves are out there somewhere. It's the hope that drives the engine of self. Why does he think of the others as lost? Because in their own lives, they are ghosts of their former selves, another way of saying they left the arena of youth. They are free in the wilderness of days. He had to drag his soul there screaming, now a new narcissist, he sees on the screen his own digitized reflection, caught each time in the narcissistic act, captured on his own, framed as in a shrine. And what should he say about his multiple pasts? And what should he reveal of his hall of dreams? Should he form there a fantasy or fix upon facts? Should he tell of that place hidden deep beneath us, the darkness he has seen? Hope is beautiful and a thing to be pitied. It's the expression of a dog being punished for wanting what he wants, still pulling at his chain to get at desire. The inescapable hunger is more powerful than pain. Now Orpheus the mortal man sinks lower than Orpheus the god could ever foretell. Even thinking of his lust, or more kindly desire, as a brutalised dog, like those he saw in hell before he turned a while to writhe. The oracle won't answer for that violence. None of these truths will Orpheus proclaim. Yet there must be words to lacerate the silence, the word in the beginning. Bending to the screen, he starts tapping his name. I am a god, he wants to shout at full breath, even as he sees what the women will see. The old gods must be laughing at his all too mortal flesh, following his gaze, facing down a questioning plea. Will I ever, will I ever, will I ever be free? And lastly, near the end, Orpheus Elegiac. Orpheus, you always knew it, ain't that so? You always carried the knowledge in your deepest being like original sin, fibrous and indispensable, a kind of fear that binds us as one. Limbs and tendons and joints and skin and something else rarely seen, a fabric of many cloths and colours with memory and hope and desire and joy and pity and pain and this mighty knowledge that the start of all days is the end of all days, that the journeys are all beautiful and, and right, but ultimately lead to the same destination, the place we all arrive after so many travels, the place of death, our very own death, always within us, the seed gone to bloom. So, Orpheus, you cannot now be surprised that your body is shifting aside, as if your own frail flesh is out to disown you, a disassociation, a brutal detachment from the core that is you, the one true self, whose body is incorruptible, Orpheus himself, a hero in his thinking, a hero in his acts, 
a giant stepping out in a world of forms diminished and pale, undeniably mortal, against he, the human, on terms with the gods, you, the man, who would always be strong. Oh, Orpheus, you are tired. Orpheus, you are weak. The world is grown old but belongs to the young. Now you have to navigate the daily offence of figures of authority, of taxmen and priests, of doctors and judges, who all seem to you children, whose energy is a bright supernova in the jet black universe of approaching death. For death it is, Orpheus, and no two ways. Your head on the block, your whole being for the chop, and the weight that you've carried from life to life will turn out to be nothing of substance. You know the Wizard of Oz was nothing of the sort, a cheap set of tricks, a lifelong illusion, as of love or ambition or spiritual growth, abstract ideals we limply lean on like canes. Fuck all that, Orpheus, you never left the block. You've always been crippled, you've always been blind, your thoughts have run nowhere in your fat, meagre mind. Your emerald city is the colour of clay, your corrugated heart is pitifully afraid. Well, I'll be double damned, go figure, no shit. The evidence has always been there to see. You must have sensed it even as a child, the, the cut that bleeds, the hammer blow of sleep and the terrible dreams and the fat sensation of diving in the deep end and holding yourself down and waiting and waiting until you felt you would burst. Death is not the source of your alarm. It's the journey. It's the show recognition of all the cliched signs that mark your way. It's absolute defeat, the impossibility of any real defense. Orpheus, I fall to thinking about you tonight as the day declares itself done and worn out. The Egyptian cotton is coarse against your skin, a delicate burning. Your body begins to rebel against night and the stillness it brings. The rage is all in you and will not be calmed. If the rage had voice, it would tell you the facts. All eternity is host to the calm and relaxed. In the grave, you'll reach the still Elysian plain. But now, to lash out, better now to lash out at your animal decline. The language of your rage is physical signs. It, in the violent spasms, it is telling you wise. Death is unforgiving. It knows nothing of caste. Death is indiscriminate and fast. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that absolutely brilliant reading the energy uh, of the language and the ideas and it feels like you are writing uh, about the now about the state of the nation about the state of all of us through um Orpheus as, as your as your prism or your um your uh, character and I can imagine him sitting there in that bar in uh, in North London I think he is um uh, and it feels uh, like such a brilliant example of uh, negotiating the now through the past and that that collision of of um, classics and the contemporary. So thank you so much for uh, sharing new work with us and um, being prepared to do that. I think everyone will now be eagerly awaiting uh, the chance to um, read the whole sequence, which, uh, as I said, is, is a is a book length sequence of 60 poems that explore all kinds of aspects of, of modern life through the character of Orpheus and how he negotiates it. Um, uh, in, in my head, it's a brilliant companion piece to um, Mehmet Isbadak's Urban Minotaur, which uh, places the Minotaur in Brixton as he tries to negotiate uh, life um, uh, in, in the world of South London. And, and perhaps there's Orpheus uh, up north and um, uh, the Minotaur down south and 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 they should those two books should be going for a pint uh, together somehow um uh, and teaching us something about the modern world but thank you so much uh Paul for that extraordinary uh reading and and for sharing your work with us it's really appreciated um our third uh poet today is someone for whom it's um an uh absolute personal delight for me to welcome because we've had the the absolute um privilege of collaborating um and that is uh Nina Murray. Um, Nina's a Ukrainian-American poet uh, now living in the UK. Uh, Nina was born and raised in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. Um, uh, she uh, then uh, went to the States to study literary translation and she is one of the foremost translators of Ukrainian poetry and literature but also 
a stunning poet in her own right and has published a number of chapbooks, Minimize Considered, Minor Heresies and Damascus Electric, but also a stunning collection, Alcestis in the Underworld, which came out from Circling Rivers Press in 2019. Um, I'm absolutely delighted, therefore, to hand over to Nina and to invite her to read from that collection. Thank you so much, Helen, and thanks to everybody who's made this possible. This is an incredible honor to be here and to be listening to this poetry from wonderful people. So I was going to read from Alcestis in the Underworld. I uh, became aware of the character of Alcestis rather young. I think I saw a cartoon about her when I was about six. Uh, the cartoon was actually about Heracles, but for me, it was about Alcestis, and I was curious uh, very much about her story. I am also, in addition to being a translator, I am in a Ukrainian. I'm also a member of the United States Foreign Service, currently on a sabbatical. But I was posted to Moscow for two years. And um, as a Ukrainian in Russia, I ended up writing these poems that became Alcestis in the Underworld. Because to me, the interesting part about the journey is what happens. We don't know necessarily of what happens in the underworld and why Alcestis doesn't speak for three days when she is brought back. So I'll read uh, five poems. They're short. And I'll begin uh, with a poem titled Collection Needs. This is a poem written about a daily sight. I was, uh, every day I would walk past a Lenin monument. Collection needs. Between the church and the west facing linen, I carry rabbit legs to be stewed into dinner, slow gated through the shirtless swarm, skateboarders, helmetless males and scuzzy sneakers. I size up their torsos, pale, whiplashed as they ride erratic arcs on granite, sway a colony of sea anemones. I calculate life expectancy at their likely age, assess combat readiness, failed flips, miss me, but only just. Tomorrow, I will walk the other way as the city's crews calm the lawns for depleted juice boxes, cigarettes, broken wheels, mop, Lenin's pedestal, edges ground down, chipped where the board slipped. poem is titled Trust Not the Dawns. This is a line from Robinson Jeffers, So Many Blood Lakes. His lines go, now guard the beaches, watch the north, trust not the dawns. At 4 a.m. run to the airport, I must be the driver's first fare. So he begins to recite the company's greeting softly in the dark orb of the car, wishing me a good morning, a happy belated unity day, resilient health, fulfillment, and personal life. And to all of us, he says, a peaceful blue sky above our heads. Which is when I resolve not to tip him for this blithe Cold War formula, his mindless rehearsal of threat, while it is I who must recall an early spring night in a country that borders his, when I lay listening for the dive of invisible jets the distant rumble of rocket launchers shivering because I knew how open it was, the window of opportunity. Deterrence, the sound of me swallowing hard and the steady drift of rain on my window. Same to you is what I actually said. He signaled diligently before changing lanes. I wrote these poems between 2016 and 2018. Each spring in Moscow, snow cowed into an afterthought, dust spins up. It is giddy, airborne, triumphant. It feels like it's going places. Settles for my shoes in the end, abrades the suede and knits the socks. A small thwarted thing turned to damage.
This poem is called The Forest of Things. There's an Eastern European tradition of keeping books um, in the Middle Ages, the noble family kept books called Silver Rerum, The Forest of Things, where they wrote whatever was happening in their lives, uh, sort of a catalog, journal, a chronicle, those things. Today we're children lost in the forest of things, our hounds scattered, the lights of home far behind, the contours, the edges, the lines between air and mass grow indistinct. They long to regain their original ignorance of their own shapes, the innocence of not being seen by us. They dream of being discovered again by someone else, animals, dogs, let them come and recall having found the mouse nest here and rejoiced at the quick gulp of flesh. The forest of things is alive. It rearranges itself. The dance of claw feet and locks at the edge of perception is stir against the backs of our hands and subtle the grays of keys losing themselves in the crowd of book spines, slipping into each other's spots to hug the wrong pages and strangle the bookmarks. The salad bowl we had to bring to the party that once filled with almonds and beets is lost irretrievably, turned a bloodshot glass eye in the shaggy forehead of a mossy boulder somewhere. Terriers dig, noises come from above and below. The trail of breadcrumbs someone had left for us rots. And the final poem that I want to read is Alcestis Returns. The epigraph is from Walt Whitman's Song of the Broad X. The door when the door whence the son left home, confident and puffed up. The door he entered again from a long and scandalous absence, diseased, broken down, without innocence, without means. Alcestis Returns. The shape that I vacated had held still, a doorway, a doorway, while I went through and then returned a different figure, one that no longer fit into what had been so solidly framed out, but no one raised the roof beam. So now here I am, an object, an objection, and a jest, a woman in a taxidermied hide that must be done to soothe the skittish. I dream what this pelt dreams to be its own thing, a wolf, an antelope, an otter, a quick ghost fox who laps for the first time, the ghost snow sparkling on the Stygian water and stops to marvel. I must not be seen if I'm to be still recognizable. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nina. It's such a privilege to get to hear you read from that. And, and um, as I said, uh, the uh, Alcestis in the Underworld is published by Circling Rivers Press. So please do get your hands um, on a copy. Um, it's fascinating to think that that was the myth that you reached for when wanting to write about that very specific moment in, in time, in political history um, uh, of being a uh, Ukrainian in Moscow. And that was the myth that you that you reached out for. And I think um, in the kind of uh, the reception history of, of Alcestis and that and that story, I find it um, uh, absolutely fascinating uh, in terms of your your that particular collection and and um, how that story provided a way in for you to write about uh, that time and place. So thank you so much. It's it's great to hear that in your own voice as well. Um, and I'm actually going to ask Nina if she'd read a little bit more for us because. Um, Nina won the Ukrainian um, uh, Institute London's Translation Prize uh, last year with a groundbreaking translation of Lesia Ukrainka's Cassandra, which um, some classicists might know as a text, but written um, uh, uh, over a hundred years ago, Lesia Ukrainka wrote a version of the Cassandra story uh, from, uh, well, a version of the at the end of the Trojan War from the perspective of, of Cassandra and as such was sort of trailblazing in terms of retelling those stories from a female perspective. And um, uh, it's a canonical 
classic text in Ukraine. But um, what Nina Murray's translation did was give us, for the first time, a performable um, English translation of it. And uh, Nina and I met because uh, I got a call um, six months ago from the Ukrainian Institute London asking if we could make a production of that happen. Uh, and we did. Uh, it was an absolute privilege for Live Canon to be involved in that and to get to put Nina's translation on stage. But it is even more of a privilege to get to hear the writer read some of it herself. So I'm going to ask if you would, Nina, if you would read just a little bit from the Cassandra translation for us, which is Nina Murray's translation of the iconic Ukrainian writer, Lesia Ukrainka. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. I still can't believe we did that production. <laughs> and um, so, um, I'm going to read just a little excerpt from a scene where Cassandra has just seen her lover, her former fiance, Dolon, for the last time. Cassandra, being who she is, knows that this was the last time she has seen him. And Dolon doesn't because he is afraid to ask, more or less. Um, he is going out on a night when the moon is going to rise and light the battlefield. So this is Cassandra, who says, not black enough, I still can see. Oh, Artemis, Apollo's sister and mistress of moonlight, pray, put out your light for this one night, this single precious night. But those in love dream one night's fewer dreams. They are so happy. Will you, for their sake, to give them yet another blissful dream, rob me the wretched of my last dream, my last and desperate wish to have the man I love alive? He was not meant for me, yet he is mine, my only one. If it is true what people say that you have known love, then in the name of that exalted love, I beg you, mercy. Enough. What good is begging? What can a goddess do against the fate or all of them? They are, like us, mere subjects to the eternal laws. The sun, the moon, the stars are mere lanterns in the house of Moire. Gods, goddesses, her servants, slaves to cruel, merciless mistress. To beg before her is a waste of time. She knows not of pity and of kindness. She's deaf and blind like Chaos himself. To beg before her slaves is likewise pointless and to wit, Disgraceful. I do not wish to be a slave of slaves. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it's uh, such a privilege to get you to hear you read your own work and to read some of the work in translation is, of course, through literary translators like Nina that we have access to so many texts and um, Nina's work particularly has allowed us to access um, an extraordinary array of Ukrainian poets um, and uh, I do encourage you to explore her many translations and, of course, her own own work. Thank you so much for reading for us today, Nina. And um, I know that uh, people are going to be really excited to dive into the Alcestis book, um, but also to find out more from your website about the work in translation. So thank you. Um, uh, what an extraordinary uh, hour of poetry we are having, um, uh, from Narcissus to Orpheus to Alcestis to Cassandra. Um, and I'm delighted now to come to introducing our uh, fourth poet today, Kostya Salakis. Um, Kostya was born and raised in Athens and now lives in London, and he was the founding editor of Harana Poetry, which is an online magazine for poets writing in English as a second or parallel language. I have found this an invaluable resource. Um, as someone who teaches um, poetry within a creative writing department to undergraduates and to graduates, um, uh, it's the first place to, to direct any anyone who is attempting to write in uh, English as a, a second language and who has any um, hesitance about that or shyness about that or concerns about that because I always feel um, uh, that Harana celebrates um, uh, writers who are um, and uh, the bilingualism, the, the linguistic joy that comes from the clashing of languages or from people writing from the vantage point of multiple languages um, and uh, it's an extraordinary resource so if you don't know it please do um, uh, explore that. Um, as a poet in 2019 Kostya won the Oxford Brooks 
international poetry competitions, English as a second language category, and his poems have been widely published in magazines, including 14 poems, Magma Poetry, Poetry London, The Poetry Review, and Under the Radar, and anthologies such as 100 Queer Poems, which came out from Vintage in 2022. His debut poetry pamphlet, Ephibus, was published by Ignition Press in November 2020. That's an incredible series. Um, but his first full-length collection, which is called Greekling, is coming out from Nine Arches next year. Nine Arches, another great independent press. Uh, if you're thinking about your uh, uh, Christmas shopping folks, please jump onto their, their website and, and all of the independent poetry presses and um, and do your Christmas shopping there. Um, but it's an absolute delight to hand over to Kostya. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Helen. Um, it's really great to be part of this reading series, uh, but I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you. Um, I was born and raised in Athens, in Greece, um, but I've lived here since in, in the UK since 1999. Um, even though my primer of my education, if you want, uh, was Greek mythology, I know my myths. Um, I was raised uh, when I was very little, I was obsessed with Greek myths, unusually so. Um, even at school, I was known for that. Uh, but that was perhaps my preparation for what became my true love, which is history. Um, I'm interested in history. I write about history in my poetry quite often. Um, contemporary Greek history, you know, the past 200 years, Byzantine. I delve into antiquity, into the antiquity. Uh, but when I was looking through all my poems, I realized I don't have that many poems that deal with myths or even allude to them but what I do have is I do write quite a bit about ancient Greek sculpture um, that is because it's part of what I'm writing about which is rejected uh, Greek bodies and they could be bodies of water they could be uh, of flesh and blood but they also uh, tend to be bodies made of marble uh, and why because Ancient statues are in our cities and our museums. We go to, with school to see them. They're present. But in my case, um, they were also my first references to the male body when I was a teenager, uh, an analog teenager in Athens in the 90s. So um, archaeological museum guys were the only place, if you want, where I could actually see uh, the male form, uh, the nude male form. So um, I'm going to start with the opener of my pamphlet, uh, my pamphlet Ephibos. Uh, so this is the first poem in the pamphlet. Bathroom in an Athens suburb, 1994. All I have are guidebooks from archaeological museums, page after page of glossy athletes, gods and heroes in bronze or marble, some missing limbs, noses, heads, others full-bodied. At first, I'm happy to look flick through the refractured perfections. Soon, growing bolder, I will them off their pedestals, let them stretch after millennia of holding celebrated poses, grant them hearts, a pulse, sinew and permeable skin. Grateful, they let me touch them. Trembling, I examine the scars dug by the plows of farmers and fishermen's anchors. I close my eyes, smell the earth that clings to tangled hair, the hint of iodine in the sweat of those raised from shipwrecks. Ignore the ochre scent of my mother's cosmetics on the wicker shelf. No one will knock and ask what I'm doing locked behind this door. I don't want to come out, though our summer nears, it gets harder and harder to breathe. Um, so bathroom in an Athens suburb, 1994. Now I'm taking us to 2020, 2021. 
in uh, the summer of 2020, right after the first lockdown that we had here in the UK, but also in many places elsewhere, um, I went to Athens for a month to be close to my parents. It was a time where we couldn't yet, uh, we didn't have the jabs yet, so I couldn't really see them. I could see them from a distance, but I spent a month there just to make sure they were okay. Um, it was also a relief to be back in Athens, to be in the light of Athens. Um, I went to the Acropolis Museum a few times. I just wanted to uh, walk around. I really love that museum. It's interesting because I also I live in London, where we've got the Parthenon marbles that Lord Elgin snatched <laughs> from Athens. I don't know if you agree with that word. Um, but then I kind of find it very interesting that I have this split in my in my life where I've got the Parthenon in Athens and the Parthenon marbles there and the British Museum here and the Parthenon, Parthenon marbles here. Uh, but I was surprised by the fact that I was quite drawn to the core, which are in the Acropolis Museum. I'd never really noticed them very much before. I'm not sure why. Um, so I just walked around, I made some notes, but I didn't really do anything with these notes until January, February 2021, when we were in the middle of the the next lockdown, I, I caught COVID myself, and it was a bit of a grim time. And at the time in the news, the Greek Me Too movement begun. Um, and so somehow I remembered my visit at the Acropolis Museum in Athens, and somehow this poem came out as a response to the Me Too movement in Greece. Kore, the Acropolis Museum, Athens. Spring sunlight blunt, the clean masculine edge of the stark museum hall, the polished marble floor, stocky concrete pillars. Years ago, my eyes paid these girls here little attention, drawn as I was to the gym fit brothers. To the herded Russian tourist, the girls may seem like clones. Formal, column-like stances, shoulders back, heads held up straight. An archaic deportment class. Insipid plaster replicas gathered dust in public service waiting rooms. They're employed to smile out of sun bleached, live your myth in Greece posters tacked on ferry ticket office walls. But spend some time with them and you'll see no two core are the same. This one holds out a dove, another offers a pomegranate. Some wear a heavy, blousy peplos, others are more lightly dressed in pleated hitons or wrapped in the cloak-like imation. This quarry has curves, another uniquely puts her right foot forward. The soil that hid them sucked out the expensive paint they were coloured with. Ochre, malachite, hematite, Egyptian, blue. So it's hard to discern the bands of rosettes, rhombuses, the birdlings on their clothes that made them stand out from each other. Their famous smiles too, meant to show they stood above the hardships of this world. Range from genial and God's blessed to something coaxed out for a business shot. You begin to notice fractures, the places where these daughters of Athens were welded back together. Wrist, neck, elbow, even the less than fragile waist. You notice lobbed off noses, hacked head breasts, buttocks, malleted scalps. Try to picture the cyclone of axe-wielding hands that struck the citadel. That extra furious energy it took to torch, tear down, cut up these limestone girls. The stunned Athenians who returned gathered the sullied fragments, buried their damaged, tongueless daughters in a pit. Right there, where it happened. And my next poem and final poem is uh, about my favourite ancient Greek statue, but is a Greek. So it's um, about the charity of Motya. Now, Motya is not in Greece, it's in Sicily, but it wasn't even in the Greek uh, part of Sicily, the part of Sicily that was colonised by Greece uh, in the east. Motya is at the very west of Sicily. It was a Carthaginian town. 
Um, and yet, so one of the most wonderful Greek statues that exist, in my opinion, it was discovered there. Um, nobody knows what its origins are. It could have been uh, looted from another city in uh, Magna Grecia. Um, I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, <laughs> my Italian friends might tell me. Um, but um, it could have also been made um, in Mortier itself, they say, maybe by a Greek sculptor, a sculptor who lived there. I'm fascinated by it because it's nothing, it, it breaks every single rule there is about ancient Greek statues. Um, and I love that, it's quite queer in that way. Um, and also my love for it is quite personal because I missed the opportunity to see it when it was brought to the British Museum as part of the Cultural Olympiad in 2012, um, because I was not in a very good place, I couldn't go to see it. But then I did see it in July 2016 when I went to Sicily. Um, it was a bit of a schlep, a little bit of a dusty schlep, but I was really happy to see it. So this, my final poem, is about, uh, yeah, the charity of Motia, or as the title of the poem is, Marble BF. Hip cocked out sassily, muscular body, a long sensual S, hand pressed ever so lightly into uncunnily soft flesh. No hero's nakedness for you. Sleeveless, rippled sand, Hiton clings with a sweat, the effort of the race you won. Sheer fabric teasers suggests your hung, your cock, unlike the reserved slugs of other sober ancients, whose toned no nonsense nudity embodies the manly ideals of the polis. Your snail shell curls are archaic. But I've seen your pouting lips on stern browed models in Italian fashion spreads. I've seen your puffed out chest strapped in a leather harness as you dance in a Vauxhall club, dilated eyes looking at no one and everyone at once. The fierce rocks of your buttocks belong to the ballet dancer I slept with once, my disbelieving hands exploring his range of muscle one delicate dawn. Marble lad, camp, sexy, mysterious, you can't be a charioteer, a rich man's lackey, maybe you're the sun god clocking out after a long day's ride on your blazing risky chariot, or perhaps you are some tyrant's trade, great on the lyre, skilled at reciting all the big Homeric hits, a rent boy put in his get-up for a kink. <clears throat> Sculpted by the best Greek hand, money could buy an extravagance, a folly, a sybaritic joke. I know, my ancestors, their eyes would see a fence in you standing on a pedestal in the Agora in your cocksure go-go dancer's pose, dressed like a woman well endowed. I think of you often. I, too, have stood on the margin of what it means to be Greek, to be a man, have tasted dirt because of it. I travelled far to find you, charioteer on this salt speck of an islet on the tip of Sicily's tongue, this place that isn't Greece anymore, nowhere near home. If you opened your mouth, what strange idiom would come out? If you tried to explain how you got here, I wouldn't understand. I open my mouth, hobbled Greek comes out, the vocab of a gangly closeted teen. The odd one out among your peers, you survived because you were trash. Your bashed face, the pock marks on your torso, betray your ending, dragged through the city, dumped as wallfield because shameless beauty often ends like this. Unquarried, you were safe, lying deep for millions of years in the pale marble seam, no one yet had called flawless. I too was safe when still unquarried and queried so awkwardly by others. In your bed of sun-baked clay you slept until the bristle kiss of the archaeologist's brush woke you. In the spotlight of this dusty museum, cracked, seas, cracked screens zoom in. 
hashtag masterpiece, hashtag excellence, hashtag body perfection. I recognize you for the curious, unbelonging thing you truly are. Mask, femme, Hellenic, foreign, Greekling, made like me. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, that was as utterly brilliant as I suspected it was going to be. And um, you write so incredibly about the experience of looking at Greek architecture and statues and antiquity and um, just ekphrastically brilliantly about how those encounters are always also about the time and the context in which we encounter things um, as much about us as about the the object that we're viewing and um and and it's a dazzling um rich uh poetry of our relationship with with the past through objects and and through statues and through things we uh look at and love and um uh, I can't wait for Greekling to come out next year. Um, as I said before, it's coming out from 20, in 2023 from Nine Arches um, and is going to be an extraordinary first collection. So thank you so much for the uh, sneak preview of, of your work and um, and for joining us today and being, being so um, uh, open with your work. It's really, really, really appreciated. Um, I want to say an enormous thank you to all four poets who've read today, to Paul, to Andre, to Nina and to Kostya. Um, it's such a pleasure to be able to take some time out to uh, experience the poetry, think about all the connections between the then and the now and all the ways that we use the ancient world to think about the now. Um, and uh, to let all of those works talk to each other as well. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's uh, been watching wherever you are, whenever you're watching. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. So a massive thank you to all four poets and I hope you'll join us for the next APGRD event. Thank you very much.